All right, so it, I, I don't want to go through this whole thing, but I just want to point out. So the idea here is that uh, I wrote this little document which has you know a brief summary of different stuff in advanced normalization tools and shows you you know just brief comments and gives a couple of links. Um, but the main thing is uh, it has these little bits of code. So if you had Ansar installed, you could like you could literally cut and paste this code, and then you would get these the results that we're showing here. And the results are just you know, okay. Um, oh shoot! What are you doing? Is that me? I feel like it was a ghost. Um, but you know, here's kind of a, a target image, and this is the canny edge detection of the uh, initial image, and we're overlaying. You see, they don't overlap. If you do a rigid registration, you get this. The, the <coughs> point isn't um, so much to show these results; it's just to show that the idea is that this document is um, it contains the code, and it generates those images on the fly, and then produces a PDF. So it's this is how people are how statisticians have been doing. I've been writing their papers for a long time. And one of the main reasons we wrote Ansar was to let us write papers, us meaning, actually, I, I personally was interested in writing it because I wanted to write my papers in this way. So that I had a, a document that showed, that gave, got all my images, images together and did all my statistics and made the figures. And so I didn't have to remember how I did something. You know, how did I, how did I get that result? Oh, why, why can't I get the same result now? And this is like sort of trying to, to make a complete package um, that would help me resolve those issues. But as I sort of became familiar with that, I learned like, okay, it's really good for writing documentation and tutorials and, and like just this example, you could compile it yourself and produce the same document that would be um, nearly identical up to platform differences. You know, OS 10 versus Linux versus whatever. And uh, the other thing in this document that's perhaps valuable is just um, you know, so we show some, show some registration results. Um, this is mix in four. So I sync, this is the original image we always use, this R16 image. And I corrupted it. I just simulated quickly a bias field. And, you know, you can see the code that does that. Um, right about there. Yeah. Just zoom this up. So... I have this image that I already read. I read it up there. And I'm just corrupting it by converting it to an array and multiplying it by a vector that increases in value with the length. And the length is determined by the length of this image, how many voxels it has. So multiply that, and that corrupts that, so I can have this gradient um, across the image. And then we show that N4, here's the, great, the corrupted image, N4 you know, does a good job of, as we expect, of removing that corruption that it did. So, you know, this is really valuable when you're developing algorithms, too, because you can do simulations like this that fit exactly the, the um, ideas of your, uh, the, the assumptions of your algorithm's model, and then verify that, that your algorithm is doing what it, what it is intended to do. And you can do it quickly on small data sets. And then we show some uh, segmentation results here. Just go back. But the, the main thing that this added was just a quick little... Oh, this is this is actually another perhaps valuable thing as we show just quickly. This is a quick uh, image segmentation and cortical thickness estimator. So I, I read the image, I get a mask for the image, I segment the image, and I send it to the Nix Kelly Kapowski algorithm, the segmentation algorithm. I mean the cortical thickness algorithm, and then you get you know this, and it takes about I mean these are two D images, so it takes you know, ten seconds or whatever it takes, and we plot it on the fly. <clears throat> and so, kind of the idea, but the other thing that's in this document is just, it's a quick lookup table for different, uh, all the different programs that, all the different programs that I consider to be important enough to annotate that are in AMPS. And so, they're category, categorized by uh, programs that have to do with image transformation, um, programs that have to do with image segmentation. So you can see we have a lot more image transformation programs. We do segmentation programs, but there, Atropos is really a powerful tool, even though we showed only just a little bit of what it could do in the core thickness um, uh, pipeline. It can do a, a lot more. Um, you see our brain extraction and next new joint fusion algorithm, and then there's some other things here. Then we have a bunch of processing programs, like how to average tensor images. If you do tensor mapping, you know, compute a proper 
at least one of the ways to properly average tensors. Um, we have this denoise image, we just denoiser that we discussed before, which we didn't Nick wrote, but we didn't you know it's not we didn't create the algorithm. Um, we missed a bunch of those. So some of these I wasn't sure what they did. Like these Nick can maybe say, I'm not exactly sure what these texture things are, but uh, it's just implement stuff that's in ITK that we were using for some long stuff. So is this right texture based statistics? I mean, well, it's like a uh, uh, Pilot's co co concurrence features and then the run link features that we did for it's it's all for assessment of uh, are they image wise features or are they like <coughs> summary measurements? The, yeah, there's summary global measurements, but uh, yeah, I mean, but, but I think there might be sort of neighborhood uh, quote, uh, neighborhood versions. I can't okay. remember. Cool. Anyway, so it gives you some guidance, and you know there are a lot of programs, so about two hundred some summary statistics. This is actually a good one. Nick talked. To you still hear about this, like you can simulate a DTI population and see if you can detect differences that you've created on purpose. So there are a lot of, a lot of things hidden in ANTS. Actually the scan function does, it actually is a C++ function that I use from R to do all the decomposition, eye anatomy and CCA stuff that we do. Um, I never use this program though, I just access it through R. So because it's just wrapped a lot more conveniently. Then we have some visualization programs. Um, Antsurf is really, really nice. It produces beautiful images uh, when you combine it with some of the other feature extractors. And there are a bunch of um, just utilities that you know you might one or one or more you might find to be useful. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the basic idea. Now I have a question. So does anyone is anyone interested in trying to run a Reproducible study with ants are. Is anyone interested now? I can, I can. We can do one of two things. I can just show sort of the results. Um, so if if we had R Studio, if a certain number of people had R Studio, we could kind of go directly through the um, the example and just kind of go step by step, and we can explain things as we go, and you can see how far we get through. As of interest, and the kind of the last thing that gets done in that is I run some eye anatomy, uh, but I also run some CCA and other things. So we could try that, yeah. and see how that goes, um, and and I'll just <clears throat> okay. So there's a directory. Can you guys read this? So there are two ways of doing it. If you have R Studio and Ansar and a few of the other programs I recommended installed on your laptop, then you can ignore this. But if you try, wanted to try to sort of follow along by using the cluster version, is that what you guys call this, the cluster, the net, whatever it is? Do you, and also, do you log on to, the, um, to nodes in order to run things? Yeah, or do you just run from the head node? OK, so um, that can be a problem if a lot of people are doing it. But these are small examples, so it's not such a big deal. So then let me just look at the readme. If I'm in this, so you guys see this directory here, Monty faculty, I guess it's in mm -hmm. it is directory, it has tutorial, 2015 directory, and I put a readme in there, so um, here's the readme, it just was just discussing what I was going to go through. We already discussed this handout just quickly. Um, now you could proceed in one of two ways if you were on the cluster, and I'll go through the RStudio way after this, but if you were doing this in the cluster, you could First, copy this ants tutorial directory that's inside of ants tutorial 2015. This is this is actually just on GitHub. So your other alternative would be just to clone the GitHub repository, which I think I sent the link to. So, but I also have a copy here if you just want to copy it, say to your local directory on the cluster. <clears throat> then, if you did that, um, you could inside of R, be inside of the, your go into the ants tutorial directory, and then just call this, and it would produce an HTML document that shows. Uh, that shows the output of the whole process, and that that way you would you wouldn't see any of the steps on their own, but you would see that the final output. Or alternatively, if you just wanted to be in your own home directory, you could just directly call um, this. Make this so you just use the full path and point it to the phantom morphology study RMD. This is R RMD means R markdown, and you can just directly run that, and it would work. It would it should work. At least it worked for me and when I tried this. And it produces this HTML doc document. The HTML document is not as nice as the PDF, but the, um, there isn't a PDF LaTeX version on the cluster that I can find. So I'm going to HTML. 
But this is also on GitHub, though, right? Yeah, this is all on GitHub. So um, now, if you are on uh, th this particular copy of this file is set up so that the paths are correct for uh, your cluster. So if I were doing this on my computer, let me just show you what I would do. And I have run this on my computer. So this is um, R Studio. Does this look familiar? Do people know R Studio? Yes, yeah. you do. Oh, okay, great. So, <clears throat> so here's the ants handout. This is just the, the original document. So R mark. Do you guys know R Markdown or Markdown? So yeah, it's very simple. And they just write some things, and then you know, uh, I'm calling the ants R library is the first thing I do, but I don't show that. Um, this is again for the handout, and uh, I say so, I write some things, blah blah blah, and then eventually I get to my first registration example, and it shows the code. Okay, that's how it works. So the handout we already went through. So um, I have a bunch of other things in this GitHub repository, like an Ansar intro. I have a REST and state fMRI example. Ansar intro is a kind of generic introduction to R, but if you had cloned the ANS tutorial repository fresh onto your own computer, the first thing you would do would be open, here, let me just, uh, I'll just try to start this from scratch so we can, <coughs> I have tons of things here because I do lots of work in, uh, as you can see, I can't even close them all, do so many different things in parallel, so <coughs> I would go, I'd be in the ANS directory, I would say open the file, um, let me see where this is, it's tutorials, so this would be exactly what you clone. And I would go into source. It's probably not organized all that well. But um, I would find the phantom morphometry study, RMD. Here, I'll just open that. I know you guys can figure all that out on your own, but then I have the file. The first, there's really only one thing you have to do other than install the dependencies, which is to change the, the kind of root directory. And it's just this variable called BD, it's like ba base directory, and so I've just set it up to be where it is on my computer. And on the cluster, it's set up to, to have the right paths for that for the cluster. Now, if I just wanted the final output, I wouldn't do anything at this point except for click init PDF and it would give the whole, the whole output. And I can just show you quickly what the whole output would look like. Okay, that's a K grant. Let's see. Okay, here's the PDF output. Okay. To the page, I'll just go to the slideshow, slideshow version. Okay, we produce this. And you know, the sec this is the title page, and the second page is the headings. So the overview of the study, the segmentation step, registration step, how we compute the Jacobian, this is all in, in R, how we do the statistics, how we do multivariate statistics, and I glom on this, like, well, what if you wanted to, this is all 2D, but what if you wanted to compute, you've got some blobs, you want to know their coordinates in M and I space, I have a quick example for how to do that. And you could kind of go through and see, you know, I describe some stuff, and you see these images, see the code, how to do the segmentation, how to do the registration. So this is an image deformed to the template, verify that the registration is good, how to compute the Jacobian, log Jacobian, <coughs> you know, set up some statistics, get some statistical map, and this is a CCA result. So we, we can go through this um, now. That's kind of what the results should look like, but the first thing to do is, is to just start in the... Um, is anyone actually doing this along, or is anyone able to do this along with me? Let's do it fast. Well, that, that part was intended to be too fast. Okay. So now I'm going to try to slow down, and if people want to do this along, then I will, we can go for each slide that we created, we will go through the code for that. And not create the slides, but we'll just call the code. If that's cool. So people are able to, okay, great. So then, I apologize that this kind of, um, so if we're, here's the header, right? It defines all of the types of output. This is like the color and all this stuff. I have a style file, um, but that's not relevant for this because now what we're going to do now is we're just going to run the R code parts, so we don't have to worry about compiling the PDF or anything. And what you do in R Studio is you just run a chunk, 
So you just say run current chunk. Current chunk is dependent on not what's in the window, but where my cursor is. The chunk is defined by these little backticks, and then the fact that you put R, and you give it a name, and the names of every chunk have to be unique. And then you end the chunk by three backticks. So I like to, I try to keep these my chunk. This is like actually a bigger one, so I try to keep it actually smaller than this. This helps if you're debugging. You know, if something fails, you know, and it tells you the name of where it failed, and just go there and you fix it. So this is a little bit bigger than what I like to have, but you know it's not too big. And I just set up some parameters. So the first thing I would do is I say chunk and run the current chunk. And you might get it. So this, there's no error here, so that's good. I've set up the paths correctly. But you might get an error if your base directory is set incorrectly because I'm defining a path here. And I'm checking if that path exists. Right? If it doesn't exist, then it's going to say, it's going to say stop. It'll stop and it'll say there's no image. So hopefully if you're actually running this, you'll be able to run this chunk and then get a result. Did anyone try that? Yeah. Nick tried it. <laughs> Did anyone else try it? I'm not surprised that Nick can do this. So I was planning on it, but I'm recording, so I don't want my typing on the recording. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so get the editor. Error by no image and this kind of no image in my template. template on right. So then, how do you? What is your value for BD? This is the base directory. Yeah, it's um, it's the it's, it's the ants tutorial master. Uh, the the ants tutorial. Like it's the directory for my laptop. Right? For your for yes. your local laptop. Yeah, there. I changed it. Um, you copied, you cloned from GitHub? Well, I had it, so yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing it on my local so yeah. Oh. yeah, so you should just look and see, do you have uh, the phantom data slash phantom template file? Because if that if that doesn't exist, then yeah. then there's something wrong yeah, with how you set up set the path. Yeah. No, it does. What was that? Yeah, this is this is sort of the only. If we can get this one step right, then we should be good for the rest of the the tutorial. This is kind of the only parameter that we need to set correctly. Everyone who wants to do this should try to set it correctly. So Josh, eventually we will get to you know tensor based morphometry. Yeah. It shouldn't be that different than what you would do for a like quote unquote real study. It's basically very similar to what we do here. I try to get you know, Pretty close to your basic TDM you know, covariates and stuff like that. So, any luck yet? Oh, we do. We have succeeded on step setup, the setup step. Okay, Vikesh, yes. Does anyone need help on the idea, the idea of get cloning? People know about get. Do you know about get? In the back, yes. You've cloned some stuff before. That's good. So everyone knows get. That's great. So no, not not everyone knows get these, these days. So okay, so we're good, more or less, for step yeah. one. I think we are good. But, uh, we just... Okay. Well, let's uh, let's move to step two. So. Uh, just as this, this summary shows, it's you know this data is manually drawn. Um, it's just three tissue images that I drew by hand, and there are two groups, and I drew them such that there are there are quote unquote group differences. Um, there are thicker cortex, thicker cortex, and thinner white matter, or something like that in each in group one versus group two. It's only eight images, so um, still not very powerful, but we, we should be able to detect some differences. So the first. Uh, <clears throat> sort of way that we can look at our data is, and I definitely encourage people to always do this with any data, is just to um, 
to look at it. So then hopefully this will work for you. So it would be uh, line 51. You would want to go chunk and run current chunk, and hopefully you would get this figure, which is something like this figure here on, on your computer. So Nick is very fast with this stuff. It seems like he must be experienced. <laughs> Any uh, luck for that? Or? You need like the latest version of R Studio. It shouldn't be R Studio. What kind of error do you have? Um, to load the library, it's an error. Um, Did you get R, R Markdown? Mm. No, I don't think so. Are you saying from the console? So what does it? Oh, you're just, so, but what does the error say? Did you start in, R? Just an R Studio incompatible library version. So you're oh you're on your local machine? Yeah. Let me take a look at this. Let's see. So you got. So we installed the library in the uh, terminal from when it went to that with the tar.gc file. Yeah, so it looks, this looks like. It's supposed to drop that, right? Mm -hmm. This might have to do with your R version. That's hard to, that's hard to debug, but I mean, yeah, you can, I'll it can, that. it can be in, you, there are other ways to install, which is just install GitHub. Um, I don't know if you know that, but it's essentially, <clears throat> This would take a long time. I don't recommend doing it, but it's something like this. So I'll get help. Nava ants are. This will do a full. It assumes you have CMake, and uh, I think actually just CMake and the compiler. I think ITK can also use ITK. It will download ITK on the fly if you have CMake, but um, but you need a compiler, and not everyone has a compiler, so I'm not going to do that. Um, so if I may interrupt, like the the. The, the previous chunk it ran yeah. through, but it didn't plot anything. Like that's it, right. It doesn't. It doesn't plot anything. It should just. Yeah. So let me just show you what happens. Here I can uh, just sort of clear out my clear all. I'm gonna clear all my plots. So I have nothing, and just go back, and then I run this current chunk, and it just there just should be no error down here. Yeah, sure. And then the next, then you can just say run. Next chunk, you get that. You're in the next chunk, and you get the next image in the in the population. So it's just you can see I've gone to this next chunk here, which is population two, the second subject, and I'm just plotting the second guy. So I put all the, the images into a list. That's normally how I do it. The way these these work is you you just glob all your you just get them all into a you get all the file names, then you convert those file names to a list of images. And then you convert those images to a matrix. That's basically what we'll do. But before we convert them to a matrix, we just want to look at them and see what's what's there. So then I'll just skip ahead and, and get the uh, you know look at the fifth guy, and you can see actually compared to the previous guy, you can already see that this is I went one, two, and then five. So five through whatever are thicker or thinner cortex. You can here if I compare that guy to this guy. See these arrows let you go back and forth between the two, the late the last two figures. So you can sort of eyeball what we would expect to see. Okay, so six is again another guy. Boom. Another guy with thin cortex. So again, thin, thin, thick, 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 thin, thin. Okay, so now um, here's a little chunk called segmentation. And this is now we're going to do something kind of more um, like what we really do. Our first step, sort of like running ants cortical thickness, or running FreeSurfer, we're going to extract some features from the data. This is very simple data, so I don't have to do anything very complicated. It's do k-mean segmentation. So I have my template. I have my, as I mentioned to you, we got all the file names into a vector. So if you want to know what anything is, you can just go and like, you say, oh, what is this? All FNS, all FNS. You just type it, and you have the list of things there. And we have a function image file names to image list, and that will convert. Uh, all of these images to a list. So you guys know the list type in R just can hold anything. And it's just a list of of actual ants image objects. Ants image objects are just wrapper to ITK images underneath. And those are really just a pointer on disk. So um, so ants are wraps ITK C stuff, so it just carries pointers around. So it's um, it's mostly it's a thin layer over C. And then what this if I run this whole chunk, hopefully this will work. 
Um, well, it's really fast, but it just goes through for each of the images of the list. It gets a mask for that subject, and this is a crude cortical mask. It does work for real, like this get mask function. It looks very simple, but there is some stuff going on in there. Like it works pretty well for bold. If you have an average bold image, you can get a mask that's pretty reasonable. Sometimes for T1, it will work. Maybe if you, there's one parameter you can mess with a little bit, and <clears throat> um, it'll get some sort of reasonable mask anyway. And then you put, um, okay, get the mask here from the X image, so X will be one to the length of the list. Uh, now I assign, I'm not sure exactly why I'm doing this. Oh no, I'm just making a variable for this image, just a whole placeholder. And I pass that image into the k -mean segmentation. Three is, so what I'm gonna do is inside of the mask that I computed here, I'm gonna do a three tissue segmentation, just on the fly really quick. Store that here and it gives me, the, the k-means gives me a hard tissue segmentation and a probability uh, image for each of the tissues. So the second one, so it's it's low intensity to high intensity. So the first one is CSF, second is uh, gray, the third would be white matter. So I have a gray matter image here. I'm going to store that and save that into my probability list. This would be like doing a, uh, what do they call it, an SPM, a gray matter morphometry or something like that. That's basically kind of what we're what we could do with that. I'm not going to do that, but that's why I have this. So I'm storing the probability images. And let's say, okay, well, what do those look like? Let's just take a look. Plot of GM. Okay, so it, it's like not a very, it's not a very, it's very binary because the images are so smooth. But I could do something like this, percent arrow, percent smooth, image three. Smooth it out. So <clears throat> this is an important operator to know. Uh, it's, called, it's from a package called MedReader. In Ansar, this means that um, GM is going to be the first entry to the function that comes after the piping operator. So if you looked at, so this is important to know, so if you look at the smooth image function, now let me pop this out so you can read it. You can see smooth image, it's got smooth images, first argument is an image, but and it tells you some other things like, well, we can, we can smooth with full width of half. We can, here's the smoothing parameter. It can be in physical coordinates or it could be a full width of half maximum, and you have these choices depending. If you want to match SPM, you might use the full width of half maximum argument. Um, so if I go back again to this plot function, I'm sending the gray matter through the smooth image and I'm smoothing with a factor of three. And this is just an example, it's not for um, really the study, but in real studies we do smoothing, right? So um, this is a really quick way to do it. And what's also good is you can... <clears throat> can you explain that operator one more time, like the, the percentage? Yes. Oops, it's not. You see GD2? There we go. Okay. Um, so, this is, you know, if you, you know in Linux you can pipe things yeah. on the command line? Yeah. This is piping in that manner. Okay. Um, so it takes this argument and uh -huh. it passes it as the first argument to the next thing. All right. And the output of this gets passed as the first argument to this thing. So what, what I'm doing in this three, in this one line, I'm taking a gray matter image, I'm piping it to a smoothing function, and then I'm doing gray matter dilation on that. That's why it gets thicker. So, so this is very valuable stuff because you can like on the fly simulate thicker cortex, then see if you can detect it, or you, there are all sorts of functions we have in IMath, you know, or, or you can do bias correction, or you know, you, so you can string together registration. Also, you can just pipe these, so your scripts become very descriptive. Oh, I took gray matter, I smoothed it, and I made it bigger, like that. You just read it like that. So very very convenient. So anyway, that that chunk was this the segmentation chunk. Now, okay, I have a. A segmentation, I might want to look at it. So I stored into this list, I stored the segmentation results so you can see there. <clears throat> now we are doing a lot of things in this plotting where, um, okay, uh, so two, one, okay, three, not sure what's going on there. Plotting has been an actual annoyance for me for some time. Looks like it might be slightly broken, but um, 
we try to automatically compute a window. Apparently, the automatic com computation of the window is better than the by hand one. Um, so let me take a look. We also computed things for for ant image objects, like you know, you can do most things. You know, compute max. Was the maximum? Oh, it's two fifty five. Oh, now I know my web why my window wasn't working, because it's like 255. So there, that's better. Um, so 0, 255, that changes a different window. So, um, OK, actually, it's this, this is the chunk where I actually look at the segmentation. So let's run this current chunk. So this is on line 98. All right. So um, again, I'm just showing kind of some this piping operation. I'm just doing again what is was in the previous list. Um, getting the mask, I, I, I dilate it a little bit because I want some of the background, um, which is this thin layer here. <coughs> this is gray and this is white. And then I store it and I'm plotting the segmentation. So, and you can see the windowing, I'm windowing zero to three. So another thing we can do is, this probably will work. can plot the two images together. So now, now the segmentation is overlaid on the original image, and we use a jet color map for the segmentation. So um, underneath this image, so it's so it's this image laid on top of this one. If it's a pair, this is just X and Y, kind of in R speak. So now we just reviewed how to do kind of very quick segmentation, and again, the, these types of scripts are very you, you can change k-means to a probabilistic segmentation if you had some priors. It's like almost exactly the same. One, you change this one line and everything else is basically the same. But um, you might have to switch the order of what we're doing here. First I did segmentation, then uh, now I'm doing registration. In the case of your priors, you're going to registration, then segmentation. So how do we do registration? Well, here we can take a look. For registration, we need a template. <clears throat> Let's see if we can. Again, I try to keep my code chunks pretty, uh, pretty short. And this first line is, is the template. And then um, making, I'm just initiating this lift list with just a bunch of images, the original images. But this is called JList because it's going to be where I'm going to store all the Jacobians that I'm going to compute for my registration. And so the next step will be I'm going to run through all of my images and do a registration. And I'm using what's called SynCC, which is actually our standard, kind of our default registration um, that we use for two and three dimensional images. And um, I'm going to warp, I'm getting the gray matter, so I'm going to get the registration result, which is a transformation file. Then I'm going to apply that transformation file to the gray matter. So here's the transformation. I'm going to warp the gray matter to the template. So the ants apply transforms needs to know the fixed space and it needs to know the, film, the moving image. Notice that the moving image is not what I passed, or this, this gray matter image is not what I passed in here. I'm registering the original images and applying the transformation to the gray matter image. Pretty standard stuff, I'm sure. But um, so how is that transformation directed? It's from the moving to, to the fixed? Yes, that's right. But in fact, the depending on how you conceptualize it, the root of the transformation <laughs> is in the template, and the, the arrow, so the root, the tail of the transformation is in the template, and the arrow, the kind of head of the arrow is, is points at the moving image. Okay. So you, you're in this, you're the template, you follow the arrow, mm -hmm. you grab the voxel in the moving image, mm -hmm. and you pull it back, it's called pull back, mm -hmm. to the fixed image, and you put that at the base of the arrow. And that goes, you go through everywhere in the image to do that, and that's how you get a transformation. So, um, in fact, this is a deformation and then an affine transform, transformation. So, um, so we can just sort of run this chunk. This takes probably a little bit longer because it's going to, for each of these eight images, compute a little diffeomorphism. <coughs> so compute the diffeomorphism, uh, apply it to the gray matter, store the warped gray matter. So this is, again, like a gray matter morphometry study. And then the last thing we do, and actually this is the critical thing that we're doing for this particular study, is we're computing the Jacobian determinant image from the transformation. Okay, This transformation forward transforms. Okay, I'll show you that in a second. But let me just, before I say more about that, just, just look at TX. So TX, or let me just look at names of TX. This is a list. 
of the registration output gives me the warped moving image, the warped fixed image, which is the template mapped to the moving image. It gives me the forward transforms, which takes the moving to the fixed, are themselves lists of file names, in this case, which are the deformation field and the affine map, which have to be together, put together to go all the way between the two spaces. But with both the inverse and the forward, you can go back and forth freely. That's kind of the main thing. And these are very close. If you look at the composition of these transformations, uh, they'll be invertible to within usually about one quarter voxel or one tenth of a voxel maximum error. So on average, your errors will be very near zero, but you know the, the maximum will be about a quarter voxel or less error, depending on how much the larger deformation, the bigger that error could be. But it will almost always be less than one voxel. Um, I'm just wondering. I know this is tutorial data, but um, for like the actual brain registrations, I know there's like a lot of different uh, parameters and options to yes. work with the registration. Are you going to be discussing like kind of how to select those or? How okay, to... that's a good question. Um, <coughs> well, uh, I was not going to, but in Ansar we've kind of coded up a bunch of. Let me just show you really quickly. It's just there's like you know the convergence factor, shrink factors, yeah, and some yeah. of these things that I personally don't. Yeah, exactly. yes, I can yeah. sort of describe some of that stuff. Uh, Nick, I think, had some, <coughs> some of that. But um, in, okay, let me see in here. Okay, okay. So if we look at the ANTS registration inside of ANTSR help, it's a little bit different than the registration <coughs> in ANTS. Yes. Yeah. That's where you see all the real parameters. In ANTSR, we don't expose all, you do have access to them, we don't really expose them. It's more of like a simplified user interface. And so what we've done is, we're giving you these different choices that we kind of hand coded the parameters. So if you compared the parameters that we've hand coded for each of these things to each other and then compare them to the description here, you will see what sort of get some intuition. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so sin, you have sin CC and you have sin. Actually, I should have named these differently, but that's how they are. So this is really fast, right? So you can get a pretty good registration between two one millimeter brain images in 3D in like certainly less than 10 minutes, maybe five minutes. And for a lot of applications, they're like, pretty good. I think you did a test on that, right? Same quick, and oh, yeah. and it was pretty good for. Oh yeah, well, we, yeah. So we uh, um, so we did uh, so we replaced. We have a quick option in the ants right. critical thickness by. Oh right, that's right. That's right. right. So it took us from I don't know, like fifteen hours to something like, more like five hours, and we looked at the ability to predict age again, and they're really. There was no difference in the ability to predict age. Right. And yeah, so it's much, much faster. It's, this uses mutual information as a metric. This is this uses the much more deeply validated cross correlation similarity metric. Which we know does well. It's been almost all of our evaluation all of our evaluations have been on that metric. However, um, uh, you know, for some applications this mutual information metric does just as well. So if I wanted to see the parameters that you use for each of these, how could I? Yes, uh, I'll show you one way to do this. This is always a good way. You can just go to the surfboards. Okay, I guess I emailed about surfboards. That's you just saw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Now this guy Matt Cavani, is, I know a little bit, and he's really a great shaper. So let's see if he'll shape a surfboard for me. But um, <clears throat> forward. Are all these scripts that you're showing us on GitHub? Yes, I'm showing you the GitHub <coughs> account right now. Uh -huh. uh, so let's go and look at the ants registration. It must be here, right? Oh, and it'll have the source code, and I can just yeah. Here it, here it is, ants registration. I'm clicking on it. So, so then you can look. Here's the code, right? It's not pretty. Um, I'm not going to pretend it's pretty, but um, <clears throat> here let me just zoom this up a bit. But if you've used ants registration, the C++ version, you'll recognize this sort of thing. It's got all this other junk which is just pasting, you know, from an R syntax syntax. But you'll see that here's the metric, here's the transformation, here's the uh, down sampling factors. Could you kind of just describe the, in general like what those things are doing? Sure. So well you know the metric, right? So Yeah, but like convergence or shrink factor or the resampling the yeah. dash up like so let me go one by one. So sure. the, the metric this is in, in mutual information there's a joint histogram you have to estimate. And if you make that histogram too large, then you won't have enough samples to fill in the joint probability, to estimate the joint probabilities reliably. And actually, this is important to know. I think in some of the long work, we use, instead of 32 bins, 32 by 32, we use 
is like 16 bins because there's not enough intensity variation to really fill, fill in that joint histogram. Um, so, but for, for a lot of brain stuff, 32 is just what we've been using for a long time. And there's enough variability to kind of fill that in with a uh, reasonable density of samples. So that's what's going on here. Uh, one is just a weight function. We only have one metric here, so there's no need to weight it differently. If you weight it, any weight function would have the same effect. So that's another issue. But then here's a the sampling. So we're going to sample 20% of the image to estimate the joint histogram. If we're doing dense registration, we don't sample. We use all of the image. So this is for the this is the first metric, which in this case would be for a rigid transformation. Um, and let me just stick with the metrics. The second metric here is cross-correlation transformation. No sampling. This is for the deformal part. This metric matches to this transform, which is sin. This, this, what I'm showing you here is, is the parameters I set up for sin bold. I map using sin to match a bold image to a T1 image. This is what I recommend. So I'm just, I'm just giving you an example. Yeah, this, no, this helps. These, thank these you. aren't the same as what I would use for cross-sectional T1 to T1 mapping. And they're not the same as the sin quick either. So this is taking into account a, you know, just experience with okay. deformation, the amount of deformation you get. You can see the step size is sort of small. Um, I only downsample factor of two because bold images tend to be low resolution anyway. Mm -hmm. If I downsample too much, you get really weird deformations. So, um, do, you, do, you two, also, sorry, do you also have a set of parameters for uh, diffusion B0 images? I use the same. You use the same? I use the okay. same, yeah. And, uh, or something close to the same. There are other issues. Do you go from A to B, B to A? Do you want to restrict deformations? Those are more application specific and we don't have general, it's more like you have to try to restrict deformation in, in plane or whatever you want. But we can start from this. But you can start with this and then you can you start here and then maybe you try to do the restrict deformation stuff. Maybe you, maybe you find that this is actually too flexible so you might increase this value here. So this is the sin, this has been like this for a long time. So this is step size, this is the uh, fluid regularization and this is the elastic regularization. So if you're finding that the standard sin is too flexible, two, two possible options. Use the B-spline sin, mix which is more regularized, probably better, better behaved, less likely to overfit, or increase the second regularization parameter, which is an elastic regularizer on top of the diffeomorphism. It's still a diffeomorphism, but it's just less, it's just the bigger that number is, the more restricted it would be. And this also has to do with the scale of the features that you're looking at. So three, this is like three boxes. Now you're looking at features that are on the order of, if your images are one millimeter, three millimeters, at the finest resolution. Because we're downsampling by a factor of two, the first res the first of the multi-resolution steps will be looking at features on the order of uh, two times three, six or eight millimeters, right? So your reg registration looks at six or, six or eight millimeter scale, then it looks at the four millimeter or three millimeter scale. If you have you know more downsampling, if, you know you're looking at four here. Now it's it's like you know one point two centimeters. That's how we get nice smooth behavior. So, this is this is this set of parameters, or in general, the set of these parameters are compromise of accuracy and speed. I'm not trying to get the most accurate. If I did, I would never downsample. I would just do scale space, no downsampling, but just smoothing. You know, I would move slowly through scale space, and but that's going to take a lot longer. So, these are all compromise of speed and accuracy. So, so yeah, you could investigate this further. I mean, we have. Sin, this is the mutual information. No sampling because that's this one that's that's not matched to uh, sin transformation and sin aggro. Aggro means aggressive. So I use the uh, I can't see this, I can't read my own code. This is why Nick doesn't like to read my code. <laughs> um, presumably there's a metric here. Josh can read it, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't find it. Oh, here it is. Mean squared. Yes, yeah. Aggressive, right. Thank you. You're right. <laughs> you can read it. So, yeah, so, so mean squared. So it's very aggressive. You know, this is assuming the images are identical. So you'll get a lot of deformation. If you're like, oh, it's not deforming well enough, we'll put, try this, and it'll you know, get there. Even more aggressive than that, and this is actually sort of interesting because people don't really know about this. <clears throat> this is like the very classic uh, time varying velocity field. You know, it takes longer. But uh, this is how you call it, time variable velocity field. Four discretization time points get integrated in order to differential equation back and forth. Mean squares metric, that equals 
LDDMM, basically. You switch out, L, I mean, squared is not LDDMM anymore. But you could put user information here, you could cross correlation, whatever you want. So this will give you a very accurate registration as well. Sometimes I use this to estimate cortical thickness. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. But yeah, it came from, thank you. It kind of came from what is what's going here. Well, as it says, it's a time varying diffeomorphism with mean square metric. I don't want to write LDDMM because edit this out. It, I think it's patented. We don't want to get in trouble with lawyers, okay. right? So, um, yeah, that's kind of the idea. Um, so that yeah, so we have all this, and the main thing was we we looped over all the images, computer registration with the cross correlation version of SIM, which is the standard one, and then we got a uh, of Jacobian from the transformations, the deformable part. And we, using the piping trick, we pipe that into a smoother. So the Jacobians, they're already pretty smooth, but we smooth them a little bit more. Again, that's a scale selection thing. You don't want to look at individual boxes, you want to look at something a little bit bigger. So that's basically what you need to do for tensor-based morphometry, more or less. You're almost done except for the statistical part. For the basic tensor-based morphometry. But what did I map to? Well, let's look at the template. Okay, there it is. I know these all sort of look the same, but um, now this is a warped image. There it is. This is, if you guys are following on, this is like line 134, but the most more important line is probably 140, the chunk at 140, which is going to show uh, the warped image sent through a canny edge detector and then overlaid on the template. And what you want to see is that these red lines kind of overlap with the boundaries of the features obviously do because these are very trivial images but um, but yeah this is the kind of thing you want to do so that's that's it that's how you you know kind of check your data with the in this basic processing actually I use it sort of I've been using it actually more and more recently because the Jacobi is actually pretty sensitive and people have sort of forgotten about it and it's really minimal uh, so in my tests like looking in some fairly large data sets if you look at the sensitivity of segmentation-based results to the site, the data collection site, actually there's always sensitivity that's pretty high. Jacobian, much less, much less. So it has some advantages because it's not, it's not that sensitive to the actual appearance of the data because we're using mutual information, we're using cross-correlation. Whereas any segmentation is very sensitive to that, right? If you're using probability, it's probably up or down just based on sort of meaning this vari variation in the brightness. And if the tissue contrast between two, at, of T1 between two different sites is, is just different, then you have a confound, and that, that almost always happens. So, whereas Jacobian isn't going to see that really, so it has advantages in that way. I know that Paul, if Paul was here, I'm sure he would say yes. I kn I've known that forever. So, and so there's just a Jacobian. I mean, they look like they look terrible, but they're valuable, and we can look at another one. Okay, okay. So now we can move to the um, statistics. Yes, go ahead. Well, is there um. Is there any distinct advantage of using log Jacobian over Jacobian? I know one is for the scaling, but it's the symmetry. Yeah, that's but, the argument. Uh, but uh, is there? I'm just curious if you. If you I mean, there, it's just if you just plot the distribution, it's mm -hmm. symmetric about zero. That's that's the whole argument. That's it. That's it. Okay. Yeah, that's the whole argument. I mean, if, you know, otherwise. Your, your sort of dynamic range is 0 to 1 for shrinking and 1 to infinity for growing, mm -hmm. which obviously those are different spaces yeah. you know, rather than be symmetric. So okay. that's the whole reason. And this is, I think, the, I'm using your uh, polynet, whatever, your triangulation tetrahedron uh, base or whatever it is. Yeah, then. the geometric Jacobian. So. Um, if you guys are really interested in Jacobian measurements, you might know that they're, that these are not at least the way we compute Jacobian measurements are they're not ideal for diffeomorphisms. You're supposed to integrate the velocity field, but we don't do that. We base it on the deformation field. So it was a decision we made a long time ago. It's basically for generality because not all of our transformations are diffeomorphic, but we want a general purpose Jacobian measurement. So, so it's not integrating over the velocity field. Yeah. Yeah, it's just looking at the deformation. And like I said, it's because some of our transformation models don't have velocity fields. So um, if we want to be able to combine them and look at them without respect to, without worrying about, you know, the computational differences of that. Um, and th this is very simple. It computes, it does a triangulation or tetrahedralization, yeah. 
and looks at the size of that under the mapping mm -hmm. and looks at the ratio, which is actually the definition of the Jacobian. It's the ratio of an infinitesimal volume under the mapping divided by the original volume. So it's it's like implementing that explicitly as opposed to trying to do, you know, a determinant of the finite difference of the discrete discretized deformation field, which you can see I've said determinant disc discretization and deformation it's already it's got problems with. Right? It's not very numerically stable, so. Um, so now we can do, it looks like this is it. So, okay, I showed you, like, basically one chunk did segmentation, another chunk did registration, and community Jacobian. Now we have this last little short chunk that does a full, does the VBM study. You know, so, done, right? so just line by line, VBM, you have to say, where in the brain are you going to make a measurement? Well, I'm going to get the mass, just, I'm just using my standard get mass function. <coughs> And I, now the key thing is I'm going to convert this Jacobian list. So I'm going to index every image, every Jacobian image by the mask. So if the mask has 10 voxels, I'm going to get a vector of size 10. And for each of those, each of the images in the list, I'm going to get a vector of size 10. I stack those up and I have a matrix of number of subjects by number of voxels. Right? Very straightforward. And then you can compute your linear regression model here. This is just standard R, which I'm sure lots of you really know this well. But the important point is that the, the image matrix is over here. This makes, as I was saying to you yesterday, this makes the regression really fast. And then Ben Candell wrote this really nice thing, Big LM Stats, which is here. You just get the model result. You pass them to Big LM Stats. And Big LM Stats gives you really nice things. You can just say, uh, give me the beta p value from the volume variable. Or you could change that and make it. So we have two variables, your volume and gender, so you could make this gender and get the p-values for that, and then it's in, in, a, in a list, it's in a vector, and then you can make an image out of that vector and display it. This is what, what this, so, you know, your entire, almost your, not the preprocessing, but the entire statistics are a few lines. And it's very, very nice. And also you do your multiple comparisons correction. I'm using Benjamin Hochberg, which, you know, not everyone likes, but that's home. Home is kind of the, what I've heard it, uh, people think is better now. I mean, statisticians, not necessarily genomis, genomicists, but statisticians seem to think the home FDR correction is pretty good. So uh, I just run it. I made a Q value, Q value image, which is the adjusted P values. I do one minus Q values, so the higher values are the significant ones. So that's it. And then we can trivially just you know plot that. And it looks like I have no results here. I don't know why that is, but let me just run this again. And I mean, I, I you know changed the I changed the Q value threshold to 0.9. I have something there, and then I can change it to 0.95. Say you have something else, you know, so whatever. I, mean, I, don't, I don't like to quibble about P value thresholds myself. Some people love it. I don't I don't get worked up about Q value thresholds, but um, so that's that's kind of the basic idea, but. So again, exercise, like if you're interested in doing this um, on the gray matter, what would you do? Well, it's very similar. You can you do this gray matter matrix, get the model, and then you do all the same things, and you make another energy look at that. It's, I, I don't, I'm not going to run it, but that's kind of the basic, exactly the same, but using different measurement. Okay, so... Um, So kind of, um, you know, it's like after four, so I'll sort of try to wrap up here, but um, what I was going to show was how to do this, this, this same study, but with CCA. So we can sort of try to remember this, what this image looks like here, but I mean, of course, I can just flip back and forth and, and we, we can see it, but um, let me just run this chunk, current chunk. So my question is, well, that's nice. I'm doing a univariate study, but aren't question is aren't brain things sort of multivariate by their nature? Don't they have to do with difference of white matter and gray matter, not just the gray matter voxel, but maybe it's the difference of the white matter and gray matter voxel that has to do with something? And that's what I think of as multivariate. When even in regression, if I just have two voxels, let's say I'm predicting the age, if I just have two voxels on the right side as predictors, that's a multivariate model. Or I'm interested in the two the two voxels acting together, their betas jointly. That's also multivariate, as opposed to being interested in just the beta on one of the predictors. That's a univariate question. 
So I'm usually interested in multivariate questions. I just find it more interesting. I think it's more natural. And so if you guys know about CCA, um, <coughs> CCA is a it's kind of correlation analysis. In fact, it's a generalization of regression. So um, generalization of regression in the sense that uh, if I have um, y is my outcome and x is my predictor, so normally x will be a little in regression. It's a matrix, and y is a, is a vector. It's just a vector. But in CCA, y is also a matrix. So now x is predicting y, but symmetrically y is predicting x. In CCA, um, the equations for that are if y was a vector, the equation is the same as solving a regression equation. So in the limit of like, or if you, you know, in the case where one's a vector, it is regression. At least in, in the in the sense of uh, traditional CCA, what we have is sparse CCA, so it's not it's not exactly like that, but it's trying to capture the same idea. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating some predictors in a matrix and putting them in here, and then I'm going to <coughs> I run this little CCA and um, usually so I, I can't probably go into the details of CCA, but basically so I have y and x. Well, you, you do have y and x, but really they're just two matrices. So I have a list of this pair of matrices. And one of them is an image matrix, the other one is this kind of predictor matrix. Uh, that predictor matrix doesn't have a mask, but the image matrix does. And by having it, the CCA know about the mask, I can do smoothing and stuff like that. So here's a smoothing parameter here. And the problem, though, with using the sparse canonical correlation analysis is that you don't have any model for the p values, so you have to do permutations so you can run two permutations here. Um, and there's an optimization about how many iterations, there's a cluster threshold, smoothing. So usually I would do smoothing. So I would say, okay, let me smooth a little bit. <clears throat> and I'll just, uh, maybe I can make this threshold, this this is a cluster thresholding, so I want to only look at boxes that are greater than 10 boxes cluster, cluster-wise, um, count, counted as the neighborhood cluster, na the size of a, a connected neighborhood. So. Um, if it's small, it's connected neighborhood is smaller than 10 boxes, I throw it away. And sparseness is like 20%, so I'm going to say each eigenvector is 20% of the brain. Because my second matrix is only really one vector, I can really only get one eigenvector. So you could get more. If this was if this was a big matrix like FA and cortical thickness, then you could get lots of vectors. So I would rerun this. My current chalk. And then uh, it takes longer. So if you run, you make the smoothing non-zero, obviously the optimization is slower. It takes longer to run 200 permutations than if um, you had a zero smoothing. And I should say that this sparse decom2, it's CCA, but the eigenanomy is it's called sparse decom. So you just, it's not two matrices, it's one. So you just get rid of that here if you have the eigenanomy thing. It's very similar. The parameters are the same. So. Um, this is taking longer than I thought, but let me just kind of skip ahead and see what's next. Oh, well, I was sort of already doing this, so the exercise was what happens to permutation-based significance when you vary the parameters? So I did just vary the parameters and you know, see what, what that does. So what you find out is that it does help to have regularization. So CCA, if it's on sparse CCA, like sparse regression, is very prone to overfitting if there isn't regularization. You, know, you have lots of little boxes, you can fit them exactly to the, almost, you know, if you have no regularization at all, you can fit exactly the outcome measure. So regularizing gives you a much more restricted space and you end up with more generalizing the results. This has been, we've seen this lots of times. So it's taken a lot longer than I thought, but that was kind of the exercise. And then the next thing I would do is I will, if this ever finishes, I will uh, visualize these statistics. So let me just go, so I can just go to the PDF. So you show you the results. Okay, so so the result of the multi. So again, this is very similar to what I just showed you. Here's the code. Um, uh, I get out the scan solution. So the scan solution is an eigenvector. It's, it's a, just another image, and I can normalize the eigenvector. There's no guarantee of what the value will be non-negative, but their range will be less than zero. It won't be zero to one. So I just normalize them so that they're zero to one, just for convenience. Then I know if I threshold at point nine, it's the high values. Um, and then I can visualize and put this, map this back onto the original data and see. This is again the multivariate idea. So now, 
um, the predictors are are actually all of these boxes acting together. So and you can look at the brightness and say, okay, well, there's this big, it's the combination of this this area of the cortex with this area of the white matter with this other area of the cortex that's driving the population difference. That's how we interpret that. So if we were looking at Alzheimer's disease, it would be likely that you would see hippocampus plus posterior cingulate plus some other thing, you know, probably a inferior frontal lobe. All three of these being related to the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or to the MUSC all at once. And the other important part here is we're only doing one test, so we don't actually have to do multiple appearances correction. Because we're not testing these voxels, right? We're just we're testing the significance of that set of voxels all at once. So, you know, you can serve power a lot that way. Okay, so, um, last thing I could show is, uh, I, I could do eye anatomy, but I'm a little bit over. But in, in Ansar, there's also this kind of built-in um, CH2 template, which is an m &I space. So you can just download that on the fly. Um, uh, then I'm just, th this is just simulation data, so I'm just creating uh, clusters from the, this template, it's just between this intensity range, A2, and I'm just a random, you know, arbitrary, just giving some signal. I'm thresholding, and you know, I'm putting it through some mathematical erosion, and then I'm labeling those clusters. So this is all using this piping trip. So I threshold, I get some isolated voxels. I erode them so they're separated because they're probably connected. And now I erode them, they're separated, and I send that to my label clusters. That's going to label each cluster and say, this is one, this is two, this is three. And that's good because now I can say, where is the location of one versus two versus three? And why would I want to know the location? Well, to, to produce um, MNI coordinates. So we also have to answer some built in MNI data. So this is the MNI template brain, this is the MNI template brain with Brodman labels, this is the MNI template brain with AAL labels. They're all in the same space. Download them on the fly, put them into a list. And then, and again, you could run this. And then we run this little function called get template coordinates. It takes about 30 seconds to do a registration between my, my, this is like my, you would think of this as your population specific template. I have some alternative subjects. I built the template for them, I did all my studies there. So then I want to map this into the MNI space and find out the MNI coordinates or the Tellarac coordinates. So, um, so it's the template plus the cluster cluster set in that template space. I put them into here and along with the MNI labels. It runs a little thing and it outputs these this kind of list of results in about thirty seconds or one minute, depending on your computer. And you get your table of results. The this is probably Tellarac coordinates. Um, depends on if you set a parameter. We oh, yeah, convert to tau equals true, so converting MI coordinates to tau coordinates, and then you, this is your table. And in Ansar, there's like a little command that will produce this table. It tells you of oh, the ten clusters I have, you're in the quad A, thalamus, whatever. So that's kind of the idea. So you get the full study: segmentation, registration, Jacobian, and reporting of results in a reproducible document that you should be able to run and get the PDF. And everything. And, you know, honestly, you can write papers this way. I mean, um, I've written, I think, the last four or five papers I've written this way. And uh, the beautiful thing is writing R mark, and you can convert to Word, send it to your clinical collaborator, you can make it edit some Word, you can, by hand, put them back into R mark, which is painful. But if you did track changes, maybe you could make it not so hard. And I like to do that because then I see exactly what they really did anyway, so I don't mind. And maybe I don't like it a lot of times, so I don't want to accept it anyway. So you just have to do that by hand regardless, right? So that's kind of the idea here. And yeah, just reviewing what we went through. And so this is a good, my idea of showing you guys this is that if you can do it on your own computers, you know, you can really see how to um, do reproducible documents yourself. And you don't have to make Beamer slides. You can make a, you know, like a, something you would submit to a journal. Because actually out of this comes LaTeX. And if you had to put it into say the Elsevier article form, that's fine, you just change the header style to also your article and it's ready to go. So you, you all my writing there until it's done. You know, I'm ready to submit, I change the LaTeX version of it. But the, the core real document is the R markdown version. Oh the other cool thing is now you can then you can you can have your paper and then you can create your Beamer version of that from that same content, right? Start with the R markdown, you edit a little bit, and now it becomes it goes directly from the content of the paper to the content of the talk. So that's the idea. And uh, presumably this thing finished.
Yeah, so if I were going to look at this, then I could look current chunk, and then you see sort of a similar thing I showed in the PDF. So that is about it. I mean, I could show you how to run the Anatomy. It would take me five minutes, but you guys want to see that really fast? Okay, it's pretty. It's pretty quick. I mean, I just have to do that really, like here in the. Um, I have to remember how to do it. But the main thing, Anatomy, is very simple. All it needs is this. And all it needs is this Jacobian matrix, which is small, and then it needs a mask, which we already have. So. Let's see the sparse decom. Okay, it's called a template mask. Okay, so I need to. So, so how I remember how to do this is I look up the help for sparse decom. Then it's a convenient dropper for eigenanatomy. All right, good. And that tells me all the parameters. So um, that's good, but I kind of can't look at both. So I can do args of sparse decom here on the command line. And see the parameters as well. So now I'm going to do like I'll call it emat. That's my shorthand. Sparse decom in matrix is equal to jmat. That's the Jacobian matrix in mask. So tab completion is always great. Template mask is those um, Jacobians in the template space. So I get that mask. And now I'll say sparseness is equal to 0 0.1. That's I'm just going to say. Usually, I have an idea of what the power is in my study. Like, right? okay, I'm, I'm studying something very subtle, so um, I don't want to try to get you know a thousand eigenatomic vectors. That's hard. my power might be like I might have the power to, to, to do ten tests, something like that, because I only have fifty subjects or whatever. So you kind of have to think about this a little bit. You also have an idea of how distributed disease or an effect might be, so that wants to play come to play in terms of sparseness, but you can't get into all of the issues of sparseness selection. We have a paper, 2015, Kandel is the first author. It go, goes into some details about sparseness and how to optimize the parameters and things like that, but a lot of time it, it's reasonable to just use sort of intuition about it and, and just look at the results. The great thing about eigenatomy, you can look at the results for free. You're not testing anything, so you just do decompositions, you look, see what kind of networks you get out, and you can play around with it and get a sense of uh, how, good, how good it is. Oops, I forgot something. The other thing that's good to do before you run these, actually I realize this is a mistake in the, CC, the CCA I ran as well, it's important to scale the matrix, which is very important. Is the next argument supposed to be in mask or in matrix? Uh, you're right, it's in mask, thank you. In mask, thank you, that's uh, not going to work. Um, so, Invex, so usually, so the, the actual the kind of advice I give normally is like, if you have 10% sparseness, then you should decompose to 10 eigenvectors. So, or let's say you want 100 eigenvectors, then decompose into 1% uh, sparseness. And we have a tool, I, I can show this to you later, I mean, if it's valuable, but there's a tool called Join Eigenatomy, which is, and this is a way to overcome the arbitrariness of spar sparseness. It's going to rejoin eigenatomy eigenvectors in a sort of optimal way based on network analysis. So <clears throat> that's an option, but in general I'll just say I'll decompose into 10 components, 10% 10 sparseness, and then take a look at the results. Let me see if this is fine. I think that's, I mean, these are really the core parameters. You want to put an input matrix scaled in some way that you think of as, okay, I just remembered another thing. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm going to call the scaled matrix is equal to scale of J mat. Here's a very big. Here's a, here's a trip. Trick scaled matrix is equal to scaled minus min scaled matrix. Okay. Why would you Why would you do such a thing? Because usually you'll just scale like unit norm, uh, zero mean unit variance. Well, if you want your decomposition to be positive, if you want your sparse eigenvectors to be unsigned, and your input data is signed, they're not going to explain much variance. And you could experiment with this yourself and see this. Um, so, but if, you're make, if you make your matrix positive, and you have positive eigenvectors, or say non-negative eigenvectors, you can explain a lot more variance. That's the short story.
So I thought this would take five minutes, but um, <coughs> but that's uh, important to note for decomposition. So now I can go scaled, put the scaled matrix in, and I'll make this verbose so we can see some of the output. Oops, what did I do here? It's uh, ugly. Do wrong. Who bugs is zero or one? She says it. Oh, okay, so then uh, maybe that's the problem. Oh, okay, thank you, Nick. That's sort of stupid, that's that sort of bug uh, should be fixed. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so okay, ten percent sparseness, blah blah blah, and it shows that we're kind of explaining about is it um kind of percent variance, so one ninety four percent variance. If you didn't scale the matrix that way, you would get a lot less variance. If the matrix had a lot of negative entries, because your positive eigenvectors can't model that. So this is something also not discussed in sparse decomposition very much, but this is true about a lot of sparse. And I don't, I don't even know how many people have made this observation, but it's definitely the case. Okay, now I did a, a decomposition. Now, how do I look at it? This is kind of an important thing. So there's a function called, so I'm going to say this, eig seg which takes a mask into template mask parts seg image is equal to enat. I'm sure this is looking like junk to you guys, but um, but I hope it will become clear in a moment. So again, eigenatomy. I ran the eigenatomy here. Sparse decomposition, 10% sparseness, 10 eigenvectors. Again, these are approximate because it's in the optimization algorithm. So these are approximate penalties. And uh, uh, the ENAT is the output. It's just shorthand. So boom, I run it. Then the next step is I want to get this, this image out. Um, I've, I've made a typo, so let me fix that. So this is going to do a segmentation of the image based on the eigenatomy of the images. So I can look at very quickly at my result. So let's try to do that. This should be something like plot on I can plot on the template the enat. I just changed a little bit of smoothing. So you can see these kind of chunky areas. There's, there's no almost no regularization on this other than the sparseness. There's no threshold, uh, cluster threshold, there's no um, smoothness. So now I'll recompute with this extra regularization and as usual it will take a little bit longer. But what this image is showing is this at this position where it's red, that means the first eigenvector has the highest non-zero value. And if blue were two, then positions where it's blue is the second eigenvector has the uh, highest non-zero value. So this is, you know, it's, it's just saying these are the non, these are the areas where these different networks are um, are lying. So <clears throat> I don't know if this makes any sense, but so now I can visualize the second solution, and you can see how it changes with a little bit of regularization. So you know, it's a lot nicer in a sense. So you can see that we we smoothed, so we're not getting some of this stuff got collected in some of these other eigenvectors. Um, this is now being so you can see that they're they're much more they're hanging together. So I, I much prefer results like this that are regularized versus non-regularized. Okay, to see the difference. So I usually use this type of solution. And again, this was done over the whole brain, but you might constrain it on the cortex, or you might constrain it to be in substructures, or whatever. And there are other things you can do with like initialization, like I was showing in the talk, of initializing with ROIs, so you can have better control of this, this solution. But just to give you a little bit <clears throat> more insight into what, what, why this is like it is, so the eigenatomy images are in a list, and I might just look at the first one. So, so you can see that the blue, all right, let me just normalize. It doesn't change anything. No. Okay, there we go. So, so you can see now the 
first eigenvalue, the raw image, which is not the binarized version, it's the, the continuous image, the continuous eigenvector is mostly zero everywhere, except for about 10% of the brain. These are the two non-zero parts. So it's like a network that comes out. And when I do the eigen anatomy segmentation, um, that was these two parts. So that's how we quickly investigate eigen anatomy results and look at where the networks are. And you can use the same thing, get template coordinates to identify where each eigen anatomy image is, where in the brain it lies, where are the networks for it. In fact, we have a thing called get multivariate template coordinates, which says, which will summarize for, if you pass in one of these things, it'll say, here, the overall collection is in this area, and each sub part of that collected images covers these regions. So you can get insight, anatomical insight, into where these multivariate decompositions are. So that's all I have to show. <laughs>